So today I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, work in sort of my field, if you will, and a little bit of end up with a little bit of work in my lab about how we use mutation and evolution to try to gain insights into human disease. And maybe I'll try to change your opinion about sort of mutation itself. So the outline of my talk is to give you a little bit of background on mutation. I'm going to talk about two case studies. Uh, one is the sickle cell mutation, and one is a CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. These names are not so important at this time, but both of these are, are incredibly important examples of how mutations that are actually quite deleterious mutations can have beneficial uh, outcomes in certain contexts. Then I'm going to end up uh, talking about a case study from my lab about an antiviral gene called TRIM5 and an extinct retrovirus and how by studying extinct retroviruses, we can actually gain insights into how younger, more uh, present-day retroviruses can potentially be treated. And I'll just end up with some comments on cancer. So most of you are sort of uh, familiar with the idea that mutation drives disease. Uh, but, you know, from an evolutionary viewpoint, mutation is really the raw material from which evolution can act on. In a Darwinian selection standpoint, unless we have mutation, there would not be sort of the opportunity to select for new traits, new alleles, etc. And we're not necessarily talking about the ability to shoot lasers out of your eyes, but there are numerous uh, examples of human traits that are clearly the result of a mutation that occurred, was deemed beneficial, and has led to certain traits being passed on to uh, younger generations. So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, uh, about uh, 10 to 12 years ago, the human genome was sort of uh, sequenced in its entirety. And the motivation for sequencing the human genome, it was kind of sort of the holy grail in terms of uh, evolutionary genetics as well as just human genetics. This is sort of the DNA that makes us human. Uh, the best analogy I'll quote somebody else in the field made to the human genome was this was like one of those old Western movies where you sort of sort of come out on a horseback and you see a few shanties all those all across the way and a lot of tumbleweed. That's essentially what the human genome looks like. There's about 30,000 genes in the human genome and they make up less than 2% of the total DNA that you carry in every cell. Uh, I'll give you an example later, but just to give you sort of a for uh, instance, uh, most of the human genome is actually made up of dead mobile elements. These are virus-like elements that have been successful or are being successful. This is essentially a fossil record of how these elements have been uh, sitting in the genome. Uh, as uh, Ro Robin Weiss, who's a very famous evolutionary biologist, has pointed out, we have more virus in our genomes than what makes us human. This is kind of a provocative thought to think about how much of our DNA is actually made up of these past viral infections. And what people like me really look at is look for signs from these ancient viruses, this fossil record that we carry in our own DNA to understand how these viruses made it to the human genome through primate genomes and how they were potentially defeated by evolution of the genes in the genome. The good news is, of course, that a random mutation has only a less than 2% chance of having any effect. It's essentially like a meteor shower hitting this mythical old western town. The chances that it would hit one of these shanties uh, is actually quite low because it's mostly likely to hit an open space. There's a lot of open space in the human genome. Mutations can fall into two categories. They can be passed on from parent to offspring, but they could also be occurring because of somatic mutations in a person by exposure to mutagenic agents. So I'll just sort of give you a brief uh, uh, introduction to the central dogma in which genetic information is inherited via DNA, is transmitted, uh, is transcribed to RNA, and then made into protein. And this is basically what it looks like. There are these bits of uh, genetic information spread up over the uh, genome. These are spliced together to make one contiguous messenger RNA. And the ultimate output of this is protein. The uh, information is organized in this triplet genetic code for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in, uh, I believe, in 1986. Each of these triplets or bits of information in the DNA leads to triplets or bits of information in the RNA, and each triplet codes for one amino acid. Now, what people like me are very interested in is how have mutations affected what position in this triplet code. So, for instance, you could have some mutations that could occur within protein coding genes but have no outcome. 
and other mutations that could occur within the protein coding genes just at slightly different positions and have very dramatic outcomes. Just to give you an example of that, in this hypothetical example, we have the um, middle triplet here, which is going to mutate. So in some instances, it can mutate to a CTA. But because CTG and CTA both encode for the same amino acid, there is no effect on the ultimate protein being encoded. This is what we would refer to as a silent or a synonymous mutation because it essentially leads to the same outcome. Now, if you were to look at the same uh, hypothetical protein and the same mutation, but just one amino acid position ahead, we would basically result in a dramatic change in the amino acid being encoded, changing the biochemical nature of this protein. Now, most proteins in the genome are basically 300 to 400 residues long, and it essentially it's like taking parts of a car and changing just one part. It really matters what you change, though. You could change the color of your car and you sort of make it more or less attractive, but if you essentially change one of the pistons that drives the engine in your car, that could have a dramatic outcome in how your car would function. Similarly, a single mutation may or may not have a dramatic outcome, but if it hits in a very critical position, it could have a dramatic outcome. And I'll give you an example of a single change like this that is responsible for causing the sickle cell disease, which is caused by a single mutation. So just to give you an idea of sort of context here, we have three billion bits of information in the genome. This disease is caused by one change. Your computer makes many more mistakes just by copying files back and forth, but these are things which we don't even notice because it's essentially below uh, error detection threshold. Nonetheless, a single mutation can have a profound effect on disease. So the sickle cell anemia disease story is a really classic example of human genetics because it's the example of a single mutation having a profound effect. It occurs in the beta globin uh, protein. So alpha and beta globin proteins make up hemoglobin, which is of course responsible for carrying oxygen throughout different parts of your body. The sickle allele makes a different version of the beta globin gene. This is able to carry oxygen, but at an impaired ability. So this is not a loss of function, it's an impairment of function. The reason this gets its name is typical blood cells, because of the beta globin genes, are very flexible. These red blood cells have to navigate the very, very tiny capillaries in your body to basically bring oxygen to different parts of your body. Because of this structural change, sickle red cells are much more inflexible, much more rigid and they essentially get caught in the traffic jams of different capillaries and, and, and veins that are navigating through the body. The net result of this is severe anemia because you do not have as much ability to carry oxygen and then uh, dramatic effects on organ failure because these red blood cells essentially act as traffic jams in kidneys, in livers, etc., and lead to a lower life expectancy. Like any other sort of inherent mutation, this is passed on from parent to offspring. But the one thing that was really curious about sickle cell disease, uh, remarked as far back as uh, 1940s by J.B.S. Haldane, was the idea that this disease has a very, very characteristic geographical setting. So you could see this is basically a heat map of where we would find sickle cell disease. Uh, in fact, this is not a heat map of sickle cell disease, but I can use this map because it perfectly coincides with another type of heat map, which is where we see malaria. So it turned out that sickle cell disease is mostly prevalent only in places that are directly encountering malaria or plasmodium, which is the malarial parasite. So there is a high incidence of malaria that correlates with a high rate of sickle cell disease. Just to give you an idea of scale here, the reddest parts of this heat map have 50% uh, allele frequency of sickle cell, which means if you were to go out and catch a random person, there's a there's almost a 100% chance that he is carrying a allele that is consistent with sickle cell anemia. Why is there such a high concordance between these two seemingly disparate traits? It turns out that even though sickle cell allele can lead to sickle cell disease and anemia, this allele confers protection to the red blood cells encoding this allele for invasion by the malarial parasite. So now if you were to sort of take this out of context of a Seattle, you know, nice neighborhood, not, not a lot of mosquitoes, and think about an African village where malaria is basically one of the primary causes of, uh, uh, of death, especially in children up to the age of 10. 
Now, if you're Y type, which means if you have normal alleles of beta globin, you're normal, you do not have mal uh, anemia, but you're highly susceptible to malarial infection. If you have both alleles of sickle cell, you have severe anemia and your life expectancy is low, but you're pretty resistant to malaria. The best of both worlds is, of course, having one good and one bad allele. So one sickle and one normal allele. Not only do you have lower anemia, but you're essentially resistant to malaria. Now, there is no way you can recognize to pass on that configuration because you had to get one allele from mom, one allele from dad. And essentially, that's what's happening. People who had both alleles essentially were more successful in passing on these alleles to their children, increasing the likelihood that their children will end up with the same configuration. But the, uh, but the outcome is, of course, one quarter of their children will have both sickle alleles and severe anemia, and one quarter of their children will be completely susceptible to malaria. So this is essentially the outcome that evolution has arrived on, just having a high incidence of alleles, leading to a high number of people who are su not susceptible to malaria. So this is a bona fide mutation. It's a bona fide impairment of function. But viewed in the context of the infectious disease, it's actually a beneficial mutation. So that's sort of the point I want to raise here, which is the same mutation which is deleterious can be very beneficial when viewed in the proper context of infectious disease. So it's an important sort of uh, thought experiment to think about, well, what if we are successful at defeating the malarial parasite? Even then, it'll take hundreds of years for this high 50% ratio to really decay down to a 0% ratio of the sickle cell allele. So what we are facing now is a high ratio because this uh, genetic conflict between the malarial parasite and the human host is ongoing. Let's consider what might actually happen if we were basically reaching the conflict after the human host had already won. And this is what we think has gone on with the second gene, which is called the CCR5 gene. Now, it's an important sort of take home to re recognize that people vary dramatically in their susceptibility to HIV infection. This is not a well advertised fact because this sort of, then you, you sort of uh, have people sort of taking risk with behavior because you kind of want to say, well, look, even a single exposure can lead to HIV infection, which can absolutely can. But other people can sort of have a lot of exposure but not get infected. In addition, people can vary in how disease progression progresses from HIV infection to full-blown AIDS, and there's a dramatic range here. Some people were found to be almost completely resistant to the major form of HIV that is essentially endemic in humans. And for the reason for that, we have to sort of take a closer look at how HIV infects cells. It uses two keys to enter human cells. These are essentially two ways to lock the, to unlock the entryway to human cells. It uses the CD4 receptor, which I'm sure all of you have heard about, but it also requires a co-receptor. And this co-receptor can be in two flavors. Early infections always use the CCR5 co-receptor, whereas later infections switch to a different co-receptor. Now, a lot of people uh, that were surveyed that had this resistant to HIV progression were found to actually encode dead alleles of CCR5. Now, CCR5 is a very important gene for cell-to-cell -cell communication, but viewed in the light of the fact that HIV uses this, this is a susceptibility gene, people who actually made no intact CCR5 were protected against HIV infection of their cells. So this Delta 32 refers to the fact that 32 bits of information are missing from the gene. Now, if you think about the fact 32 is not a multiple of three, which means when you remove 32 nucleotides, not only have you removed those bits of information, you're no longer making that protein. It is essentially degraded because it's not a multiple of three. You've got a frame shift, if you will. As a result, people who are not making this protein do not get the same incidence of HIV infection of their cells and are protected. Now, when this observation was made, human geneticists got really interested in this because HIV is a very young disease, yet the incidence of people who had a CCR5 Delta 32 mutation seemed to be quite high. In fact, when we looked at sort of a world map, they seemed to be very heavily concentrated just across northern Europe, just uh, north of the Mediterranean. Uh, this number can be as high as 10 to 13% in certain populations. And this, again, did not make sense because we know that HIV origins in humans was in Africa, yet that's not where we find most of the Delta 32 mutation. 
what people began to recognize was this probably was an evolutionary echo of some sort. And perhaps this echo revealing sort of the source of this echo could reveal why we have these alleles at high frequency. And this sort of came to fruition when people began to realize that the same gateway that HIV uses to infect cells is used by the Yersinia pestis, which was the source of the Black Plague that swept uh, Europe 800 years ago. Now you think about what must have happened then, you know, you sort of, we have sort of the comedic version in Monty Python and bringing out your dead, but sort of the sobering version of that was entire villages were essentially wiped out. And the only survivors were probably the rare survivors who did not have the susceptibility genes. In fact, mutations, bona fide mutations, which would have been lost except for the fact that those were the only people who passed on their genes when viewed in the light of the Black Plague. So what we have here is a, an evolutionary echo of an ancient infection that is now being brought back to life, if you will, or back to selective sort of uh, dominance because of the fact that it's being used again by the HIV receptor. So viewed in light of all this, this is basically really kind of a very high stake arms race between the virus and the host. In this context, and this happens on a daily basis, especially in flu season in your body, because you encounter a whole battery of viruses, especially if you use public transit. And then what happens is these viruses will get cleansed out by the current repertoire of your immune system. Now in that context, if a viral mutation arises that is no longer recognized by the current sort of antibodies in your system, this will go to fixation very rapidly. This virus variant could be very rare. It could be at less than one in a million copies. And yet that's the only version that will survive in a matter of days because it had the evolutionary advantage of escaping immune detection. This now forces the immune surveillance proteins to adapt to keep up with the extant version of the viruses. Now this is happening on a daily basis in terms of the antibody virus response, but exactly the same thing is happening in the context of evolution where our host genes that protect against viruses and, and viruses which are probably even extinct, what we have here is a record of how these mutations evolved and how these antiviral genes were used and evolution of these was used to actually protect against viruses. And I'll just give you an ex a quick example of that from my lab. Uh, this concerns the protein TRIM5, which is an antiviral defense gene that is actually very effective against defeating retroviruses. The way this works is this protein is kind of like a sentinel, exists in the sort of cell. As a virus enters, it enters kind of like a spaceship. It's got many modules and they're all sort of docked together. What TRIM5 will do is quickly bind onto the spaceship and disassemble the modules as quickly as possible. If it does so successfully and fast enough, this virus will not be able to proceed through its life cycle. So this is essentially a very, very kinetic process. If you recognize the incoming virus quickly, you will be able to defeat the virus. And keep in mind, TRIM5 is expressed by every cell of your body. This protein is the single most important reason why rhesus macaques cannot get HIV infection because their version of TRIM5 is completely able to recognize the incoming HIV capsid. This is how this protein was identified by actually recognizing the genetic basis. Human TRIM5 was not as effective as, as rhesus TRIM5, which is why we have HIV disease. It actually turned out that human TRIM5 was remarkably weak considering that, you know, sort of this had evolved as well as rhesus TRIM5, but the only virus it was able to defeat was this virus called NMLV, which is a mouse leukemia virus. And it actually was completely ineffective against any primate viruses. So we reasoned that perhaps human TRIM5 was selected to defeat an ancient virus, perhaps millions of years ago. Now there's no real way to, for us to basically figure out what those viruses were, except for retroviruses, because as I mentioned earlier, these retroviral infections have left imprints in our genome, which we can use to actually try to decipher what these arms races were earlier on. So these are called endogenous retroviruses because they're not infectious any longer, but they've left imprints in the genome. And some of them can be very old. You can see there are some viruses that entered primate genome 65 million years ago and have basically been inherited decaying because of mutation, but nonetheless remnants of those past retroviral infections.
whereas uh, other viruses like this Peter virus that I'll talk about in the next slide is a very young virus that actually only entered certain species. And is so these are all bona fide infectious viruses, perhaps some of them just as uh, dramatic in terms of uh, disease as HIV. The only difference is they're no longer active, they've been dead for millions of years, and they've left their imprints in the genome. We were particularly interested in these viruses because 8% of the human genome is made up of these dead viruses. So keep in mind, two, only 2% 2 is made up of human genes. And in particular, we were interested in Peter because this was a virus that was active about 4 million years ago and made about 100 copies in both the chimp and gorilla genomes, but no copies in the human genome. And we wondered whether there was some genetic protection that allowed us to defeat the Peter virus so that it never entered the genome. Now the goal was of course to test TRIM5, that's what my lab wanted to do. The problem of course was this virus went extinct four million years ago. So that's where we can actually use a mathematical trick um, to actually try to reconstruct what this dead virus must have looked like. I, I sort of, uh, I'm trying to sort of use an analogy for this. So my, my kids go to daycare and if you were to take a four year old daycare class and give them a picture of the Mona Lisa and let them sort of give them a can of paint and sort of come back after some time, it'd be pretty hard to recognize the Mona Lisa, especially in the class my, my son goes to. Now we can do a different experiment though. We can give every child a separate picture of the Mona Lisa and give them their own can of paint and now come back after about half an hour. Each picture will look just as obliterated like in the first example, but because each child make independent prints or imprints on the picture, we can mathematically reconstruct completely accurately what that picture must have looked like. So what we have here is hundreds of independent insertions or hundreds of independent imprints left in the chimp and the gorilla genomes. And because these were all independent and have all been independently affected by mutation, we can reconstruct what that source infectious retrovirus must have looked like. So uh, what me and my colleague Michael Emmerman did was we basically just took one gene which we know is responsible for uh, interacting with TRIM5 and put it in the backbone of and try to see if we can resurrect this ancient virus, just resurrect one gene. And so we went through the process and what we could basically show that, that if we came back to that mathematically constructed ancestor, this viral gene could confer 4% infection, which is not a very strong infection because at this level, HIV would give you a 60% infection. But keep in mind, this is kind of a Frankenstein virus only designed to give you one round of infection because we were concerned about what this virus might do, even though we do this in an important uh, facility that is designed to study HIV. The, the bottom line is that this was a, one of the best examples of studying how we could reconstruct these ancient viruses. And the result that was really exciting for us was when we tested this reconstructed retrovirus, we found that human TRIM5, in the, in the absence of any TRIM5, you have 100% infection. But human TRIM5 gives you only 2%, which means human TRIM5 gives you dramatic protection against this ancient virus that never entered the human genome. Whereas if you were to reconstruct back to the ancestor, just one amino acid change essentially lost all of that protection. So the, the, all of these changes that had accumulated in TRIM5, one of these was completely essential for protecting against Peter. There's a sort of sad ending to the story though, because the same mutation that protects us against PTERV makes us more susceptible to HIV. So this is sort of the trade-off uh, example that I use because evolution, of course, doesn't have the foresight. You're basically doing whatever you can to deal with the current virus. But because of this sort of way this tape runs, the way our ancestors defeated old viruses really can sort of dictate how we do against a younger virus in terms of our susceptibility. So uh, I'll just end with sort of examples of rapidly evolving genes that we are sort of really interested in. Many of them are involved in host pathogen uh, and I, you can see why because these are all arms races. But then there are many that we can't completely explain. Uh, of course, we can explain dietary adaptation because, you know, sort of wasabi is clearly an acquired taste. So <laughs> appearance, you can see why that would sort of make a difference in terms of whom you could successfully uh, have kids with, sensory systems, etc. But then parts of brain anatomy, et cetera. These are all very rapidly evolving genes which we'd like to understand.
what my group is very interested in is why there are cancer susceptibility genes, including BRCA1, which are some of the fastest evolving genes, and whether there's an undercurrent of an infectious disease agent that we are missing because of all our studies, and maybe we need to identify that. So uh, that's sort of my talk. I'd be very happy to take questions. I just want to acknowledge the people who did the work because this is all done in an academic setting. Sarah Sawyer and Michael Emmerman did almost all the work that I described today on TRIM-5, um, and this was funded uh, by the National Institute of Health. I'd be happy to take questions. certainly there's going to be a reprise. I mean, this is, in, in some ways, uh, we kind of won the lottery with the swine flu this time. It doesn't sound like that. It was, a, it was a pandemic. But the reason we think we won the lottery is because flu season was already ending. And uh, even though it basically made it to all parts of the globe, this is not where we will see. But we will see swine flu. Variants are around. They're, around, they're sort of everywhere. It, it's an important caveat to think about sort of swine flu is there was a lot of, uh, I won't use the word paranoia, but definitely more excitement than was perhaps necessary because we didn't know what we were dealing with. Uh, we now know what we're dealing with. We know what the variants are. We know what the sort of human susceptibility is. And there are people who are in strong danger in terms of swine flu infections, but these people are also in danger with a sort of I would never use the word commonplace, but to the common flu. These are people who have susceptibility to surviving uh, influenza, period, not just swine flu. And so there are, you know, healthy individuals should, should be able to, if they're diagnosed early, you know, they should not be sort of this public health hysteria. The bigger problem in terms of sort of the economy of disease protection is, you know, you will have basically a million people who will be simultaneously sick. And that's obviously not good for the economy or sort of for running. Uh, but in terms of the public health sort of susceptibility of swine flu, uh, it's pretty clear now because we've seen enough sort of index cases, et cetera, that this disease, even last year when this sort of it was on its peak, uh, killed fewer people in terms of percentage than the common flu did, for instance. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Strangely enough, next month's topic is by Alan Dietrichs on uh, influenza infections. Yes, actually, all of those are covered in the infectious disease unit in uh, at the Hutch, for instance, and there's a huge department of stud devoted almost entirely to those organisms at the University of Washington. Uh, so, what's strange about this, and th this is this is where the cancer center part becomes a little bit interesting, is with the exception of Helicobacter, there's not a lot of correlations with bacterial infections and cancer, right? That that's that's uh, first. The other thing is. Certain types of viruses can be really bad. For instance, influenza as an RNA virus can be very bad, but no RNA virus has ever been sort of correlated with any kind of cancer. So there is seem some, something about the biology, for instance, of things like herpes viruses or retroviruses that is more amenable for in terms of disease progression to cancer, and that's what we are very interested. This is why the, our focus is a little bit more skewed. It's actually not... Uh, as general or as sort of uh, broad as it would be because the, the goal still is, uh, mission statement of the Hutch is still uh, cancer is the focus. And so that's sort of one of the goals. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's kind of what I was alluding to without saying it quite so strongly because we actually don't have any evidence for that. But the high prevalence of disease susceptibility genes, for instance, BRCA1 genes, that lead to higher progression of, or higher likelihood, if you will, of developing breast cancer, there's a clear ethnic uh, 
prevalence to those genes. There's a higher uh, prevalence of prostate cancer in certain ethnic groups. And the, the thought is, uh, in prostate cancer, there is one of the genes that has been identified is called RNAsL, which, uh, you know, in a different talk I would have talked about because it's a bona fide R antiviral gene. We know how it works. And somebody actually asked me the question, what is really curious about these studies is these genetic associations where we see, okay, if you have this version of this gene, you are X percent more likely to develop cancer, uh, end up being antiviral genes. And so that's where, that's where the field stands, if you will. We don't have an explanation of why an antiviral gene would lead to a higher incidence of cancer unless you were to sort of fill in the sort of gap, which we're trying to do. We're saying that there is some unknown etiological agent, which in the context of an impaired allele of antiviral defense can together give rise to a higher incidence of cancer. So we're trying to fill those holes, and many people are trying to do that on many different types of diseases. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Okay. I will repeat the question. Should I repeat the three questions that have happened? Yeah. <laughs> if you could do it by memory, it's okay. Yeah. Is the question back here? The question that just happened was whether uh, having some cancer-causing genes or alleles could in fact be beneficial the same way that sickle cell anemia, even though it causes anemia, is actually a beneficial uh, mutation in the context of malarial disease. Should I go for the previous question? No. no. Once upon a time, when I was a small boy, the Millers in Wisconsin got a lot of money with the concept of slow viruses in your genome eventually popping out and causing cancer. This led to the sequencing of the human genome. Do we still believe in slow viruses that are activated sometime in your life causing cancers? So uh, this is a great question. There's actually a fantastic science fiction book, which I cannot for the life of me recall which is based on that premise. Uh, so those 8% of the human genome that is made up of these dead viruses that are all dead. There is not a single active virus in our genomes that we carry. Now that's not to say that people could not, some people could not have active versions of those viruses because some of those viruses we estimate because we can say based on mutation, probably went extinct within the last 10,000 years. So there could be people who have just, by luck of the draw, still have active versions of the virus. But we have never seen uh, a human genome with an intact uh, retrovirus. Now the curious finding, of course, is if you look at cross-sections of ovarian cancer, they have what is a classic characteristic of a retrovirus. Yet we know that they don't, uh, they don't like highlight any known viruses. Uh, and so when people have made reagents to look for these dead, presumed dead viruses, they have now found that in some people and in some cancers, these viruses are actually making bona fide virus-like particles in the cell. Now, they can't leave the cell, so they're not infectious particles, but nonetheless, they could be causing an enormous amount of disease within the cell. Does that answer? Yeah. Question? Uh, I'm not an ovarian cancer person, and I should sort of presage. The question was, is that why ovarian cancer is so deadly? Uh, ovarian cancer is one of actually the deadliest cancers in terms of prognosis. Uh, it is not believed, ovarian cancer is actually one of the cancers where we do not believe that there is a genetic predisposition to, based on the sort of uh, susceptibility to, to viruses. That doesn't mean it may not exist. Now, it's important to keep in mind that if you look at a cancer cell, there's a lot of the human genome, that 98%, that just ends up getting made. And that's actually a defect that cancer's genomes just have. So this could simply be kind of the quality control of the cell has just gone amok. And so what you're doing is you're just making RNA, which should not really be made in, an, in a typical cell because the quality control mechanisms have broken down. And this could be a result of that. Now, whether this is directly related to the uh, disease is uh, not something that is actually really thought of as a likelihood, yeah, in ovarian cancer. Yes. 
So uh, the question is, is there any advantage to having these dead viruses in our genome? So this is a little bit of a tangent to, to tonight's topic, but it's a really interesting topic and something that my lab really is interested in. So there are a number of genes which we now consider bona fide human genes that have come to us by virtue of viruses. So I'll give you an example. This is kind of like a folk tale of a virus called HERV-W. It stands for Human Endogenous Retrovirus W. That's just the designation. This virus was active, we estimate, about 35 million years ago. And about 35 million years ago, it entered a primate ancestor and left about 60 imprints in the genome. All of those imprints have essentially died, essentially like sand going over footsteps on the beach, for instance, right? One of them has not. And the entire virus has not survived. Just one gene, which is actually the envelope gene of the virus. Now, when you tell a virologist it's the envelope gene, we get really excited because the envelope gene is the single most, this is the single reason why viruses are infectious. This is the gene that will negotiate with host cells to basically mediate entry. So what is this gene doing? This gene is now called syncytin. The same gene is actually being used in human placental formation. So if you think about the process of moving nutrients from mom to baby, that process is caused by, by the placenta and it's caused by a specialized cells called trophoblasts that essentially take up nutrients from mom and move it to baby. And the process by which this happens is a process of cell fusion, which is biologically exactly the same process as virus entry into cells by membrane fusion. So it actually turns out that syncytin uh, is probably one of the important genes in the human genome for this. So this is an example of making hay, kind of making lemonade out of lemons, right? So this was one of the genes that entered the genome and ended up being useful because of its expression, and it turned out to be something that was useful for placental formation. Now, the story gets even more bizarre because if you look at mice, mice genomes, they have their own versions of syncytin, which are not the same because, of course, the retrovirus that infected them was different, and their version has also now acquired an essential role in placenta. The same process has happened in sheep, and we are just investigating where the same process happened in cats. So in four different mammals, the process of placental formation, which if you think about it, mammals didn't all start off giving live birth. You know, sort of 600 million years ago, we sort of split off from birds, which were egg-laying, and then the earliest mammals like platypus are also egg-laying. And somewhere in the course of mammalian evolution, and kangaroos are the first example of this, we became sort of live birth-laying mammals. And placental, the birth of the placenta was an important um, sort of invention, if you will, an evolutionary invention. And this is not sort of mostly our work, I'm just sort of recounting, but Terry Heidman, who's one of the world's experts on virology, has uh, made several provocative statements that we would not be giving live birth as, as mammals unless it was for the invention of these envelope genes, which if you think about are actually quite unique. I mean, the process of membrane fusion is not something you could just acquire by the process of slow mutations. It's much easier to just steal it from a virus, and that's what four different mam mammalian genomes have done. Yes? Uh, so that's actually a, a, a great question. So how do we know that this envelope gene, like the syncytin gene, comes from a 35 million year old virus? Uh, it's, it's basically back to that Mona Lisa painting, right? Where if all that survived was her smile, and that was basically what's being preserved, the rest of the painting has not obliterated to the point where we can't make our features. We can still make our features because 35 million years might seem like a long time, but in the genome, that's not enough time for mutation to completely eliminate all vestiges of that original. So we can still see the boundaries of the virus uh, as it entered, and by using uh, sort of our ancestral viruses like lemurs, which basically predated the birth of this retroviral gene, we can see what the gene must have looked like prior to insertion and post-insertion. So we can completely reconstruct. So that's the sort of, that was the example that I was using with Peter. Given enough sequences, you can completely retrace all the evolutionary events that happened, even if they happened 35 million years ago. So that's the thing that's so kind of exciting about the field. I mean, we're doing archaeology, but we're basically doing archaeology of post-virus interactions. So. Uh, 
for the same reason that their immune surveillance genes have seen this. So our entire vaccination strategy is based on educating the immune system to recognize certain epitopes. So for instance, if you have seen uh, a certain version of the protein before, you don't have to de novo recognize a new epitope as if it's a sort of new. You have these immune uh, surveillance genes still sort of floating about. They've dampened a little bit because you've not been constantly exposed to the flu. But instantly, within a matter of hours, this population can be ramped up to basically defeat the flu. That's the entire sort of concept behind, for instance, the flu vaccine. In the case of where you're actually infected by the, by the pathogen itself, if you survive that, that's a, I mean, you have basically the, you know, we're not making guesses. As you know, when you make a flu vaccine, it's kind of ahead of season and you're taking guesses as to what the prevalent variant is going to be. Here we know what the variant's gonna be because we know what the sequence is and people who got it were already, their immune system is already pr primed for what that version is going to look like. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry for not repeating the question. The question was, why did people who got swine flu this year around, why would they have an advantage when the next season comes across? 